In this episode, we're going to set up a framework for aiming based on camera direction that you can use for any channeled spell or ability. So if I hit 2, then I activate my ability and I can turn the camera, he's not aiming. But if I hold down my right mouse button, aiming just fine, close to a 180 degree arc. Let's get to it. Hey guys, welcome to today's episode. And really this episode is focused on a specific problem for a specific ability that we set up in our last episode, but it's really universally applicable. And although I'm specifically setting this up for channeled abilities, you could really use this for any ability for aiming. So even for an ability that's a one-time cast, like a fireball that we're gonna do in a couple of episodes, there's always this like ramp up period where the player is casting the ability. So I'm thinking that even in that case, we can use what we're doing this episode to determine the final aim location, like where we're actually going to aim when that fireball is created and released. So there are a few new concepts in this episode, like the player controller, and although it's hard to believe because it's so foundational to everything we do in a game, we haven't even talked about player controller in this series. But the reason we're bringing it up this episode is because for the third person character, we're using our player controller to get the direction that we're facing our character, and then from that direction, we can use that to calculate our aim. So that's where the final two concepts on this list come in. The R interp2 node, that's gonna help us transition from whatever our rotation is currently to wherever it needs to go and smooth that out over time. And we're gonna do that via the transform modify bone node in our anim graph, specifically our state machine when we're channeling spells. So let's get to it. So in our last episode, we set up that flamethrower ability that you saw in the intro. And we basically need to resume where we left off working in the anim graph to get this working with the camera aim. So let's navigate to the content drawer and we gotta go into our animation blueprint. And mine is under my core folder, ABP third person character. And so last episode, we set up in our anim graph our spellcasting standing still state machine, and we have this channeled spell loop one and loop two. So basically, we've got to get the camera aim working during the channeled spell effect. So not when this spell is beginning, not when it's like charging up, not when it's ending, but specifically during these two animations. And because the aim is going to change in real time, we need this to be evaluated every single tick. So the way we're going to do that is via the event graph. And in our event graph, I'm just going to navigate up here. So event blueprint update animation. And so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to add an additional sequence node right here that's going to assess whether or not we need to adjust the player's aim. So I'm going to select add pin. And then from this, I'm going to drag all the way down here some of this stuff we've set up in previous episodes, and we're going to do a branch node. And I'm also going to double click just to add a reroute just so it comes out around this other line here. And so the reason we're adding a branch node is we have to evaluate something. We have to evaluate whether or not we want the player's aim to be adjusted based on the direction of the camera. And I was thinking about what variable we want to use to assess that. Because last episode, we set up both channeled spells and spellcasting standing still. And I think we still want this to work even if it's not a channeled spell. So I'm leaning towards using spellcasting standing still. We might come back to that at some point in the future, but that's the variable that we're going to use. And then if this variable is true, that's when we're going to adjust the aim based on the camera position. So I'm going to connect this up and I'm just going to get rid of the uh, debug thing here. So I'm going to say no debug object selected. And so now we need to begin by getting the difference in rotation between our camera angle and the character themselves on the screen. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to get the rotation of what's called the controller relative to our player. So let's set this up first, and then I'm going to explain a little bit what the controller is and why the rotation of the controller adjusts in that manner. So we're going to start by right clicking and saying get player controller. And we'll drag out a pin here and we'll get the control rotation. And so just to give a really quick overview of the player controller, it says a player controller is the interface between the pawn and the human player controlling it. The player controller essentially represents the human player's will. And up here, the player controller implements functionality for taking the input data from the player and translating that into actions such as movement, using items, firing weapons, etc. And so the reason that we're using the control rotation here is that it's the rotation that I, the player, really my view of the world. It's that rotation in the world. And to get our character's rotation in the world, well, we've got to get a reference to our character. So I can drag in a reference there, and I can specifically get the capsule component. And it's all the way at the bottom here. And then from that, I'm going to get the world rotation, because these are the two rotations which we need to compare, right? I'm just going to drag the character up here, move these over. And the way we can compare these two rotations is we can get the delta, delta rotator. Delta just means we're getting the difference. And now let's pause here a moment because I want to go into our player skeleton and I want to talk about the bones in our player skeleton that we're actually going to manipulate in the camera aim. So to get to the skeleton, we come up in the top right, select here, 
And initially, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, well, we got to manipulate the arms and the shoulders, right? Like the clavicle bones, we got to go like this and like this and like this. And the more I thought about it, the more I realized that that overcomplicates it. Because realistically, if we have a channeled spell or ability where we're using both hands, basically we're using the full force of our player to cast that spell, we're going to use the entire upper body, right? Maybe if we were spell casting with a single arm, like I was just doing this, then we got to do it with an arm. But if we're using both arms, and if the arms are remaining relatively consistent, so think of the flamethrower ability, like I'm just going like this the entire time then what's going to happen realistically is my entire upper body is going to turn. It's going to turn up, it's going to turn down, because I'm keeping my arms relatively consistent for whatever spell or ability I'm using. And so I realized the easiest way to do this is to adjust the entire upper body, and that's really these five spine bones right here. So what we can do is we can figure out what the rotation of the entire spine should be based on the camera aim, and then we can split that rotation into five segments so that no one bone is twisted so much. So let's go back to our third person character. And the first thing we're going to do is we're gonna create a new variable. And I'm gonna call this spine rotation. And this is gonna be the rotation of each of the five bones. And this is going to be a variable type of rotator. And I'm also gonna come up to the top right corner. I'm just gonna classify this under spell casting just like we did with our other abilities last episode. So now I'm gonna drag in a reference to spine rotation, say get spine rotation. And to be honest, I could just set the spine rotation directly via delta rotator, but I don't wanna do that. And the reason is that whenever I'm changing the rotation of something, I never want it to be set instantly. We need the rotation of blend based on where the rotation currently is compared to where we're actually aiming. And we need the blending to be pretty fast because the aiming needs to be very responsive, but it can't be instantaneous because ugh, if we suddenly move in that direction, it just looks too fake, too robotic. So we're going to use something called an R interp2 node. So if you drag out a pin, select that. And if I hover over this, I get some help text. So it says, tries to reach target rotation based on current rotation, giving it a nice smooth feeling when rotating to the target location. And what interp stands for is interpolation. And what interpolation is doing is it's using fancy mathematical techniques to figure out, okay, we've got these two points or these two rotations, and we gotta figure out how we get from one to the other. And can we identify some stops along the way so that it seamlessly blends over time? And linked in the description below, I have some more resources about interpolation and the R interp2 node if you're curious. But in playing with this, the best settings I found were a delta time of about one and interp speed of 0.3. And so to explain this as best I can, and by the way, if I get this wrong, please correct me in the comments below. So the delta time is saying, okay, how much time since last tick? So this is set to one, so it's doing this every single tick, but it's saying since the last tick, how much of the overall interpolation do we want to do? And this is 0.3. So it's doing about 30% of the transition from here to here every single tick. And so now instead of just connecting the delta rotator directly to it, I need to do some math here because I need to split it into five pieces for one, but also the X, Y, and Z here don't match up to the X, Y, and Z of our spine bones. So let me drag this out and I'll show you what I mean. So we're gonna right click on this, we're gonna split the struct pin, and from the X I'll drag out a pin, and this is gonna be divided by, and it's gonna be divided by negative five. And for the Y, I'm basically doing the same thing, but this one put above the one below. So I'm gonna divide, and it's gonna be by negative five. And that five corresponds to the five spine bones that were spreading that rotation across. But the reason these are switched is because the rotation of this delta rotator is not the same as the rotation of our spine bones. The axes are reversed. And then for the Z, very similar, I'm just gonna divide that, but that's just gonna be by positive five. So these two should be negative, this one positive. But before I do that, we need to clamp each of these values. And the reason we need to clamp it is we never want the player's spine to be able to turn fully around, right? So maybe if you're double or triple jointed, maybe you can do that. The typical person, they're only gonna be able to turn, you know, at most maybe 90 degrees. And actually I found it working best if I clamp it at about 75 degrees total, which means each of these has to be clamped at 15 degrees over the five bones. So I'll drag out a pin and I'll search for clamp. It's gonna be clamp float, and it's gonna be a minimum of negative 15 and maximum of 15. And then I can just select the clamp and I'll duplicate that two more times. And so now I'll connect this up to the X, this to the Y, this to the Z. And now from this, this is where we're setting our new spine rotation. So I'll drag in a reference to our spine rotation set and connect this up. And then all the way back here, if spell casting standing still is true, then we're gonna set it, compile and save. So now we got our spine rotation variable, but it's not yet doing anything in the animation. So we gotta go back into our anim graph and specifically we've gotta go back into our state machine that we set up last episode, spellcasting state machine, and each of these, the channeled spell loop states. 
So this is very similar to what we did in episode 23 with the torchlight effect in the arm moving up. So we've got to create a lot of space here because we're going to do a local to component. And that's what allows us to then manipulate individual bones in an animation. And I'm going to create even more space here. Now the magic here is going to be done with a transform modify bone node. So I can drag out a pin from the blue, transform modify bone. And I've got to select our bone to modify and we're going to start with spine 01 and work our way up. And then I can drag in our spine rotation variable right down here, get, connect this up to rotation. And then back on the node here, instead of ignore for rotation, we are going to add to existing rotation. And we don't need to worry about turning this on or off with the alpha because it's only going to be on when the channeled spell animation is running. And in our event graph, only if the spell casting standing still Boolean is true. So now we need to copy both of these. We need to duplicate them four times so that we can spread this over all five spine bones. So this one's going to be spine 02. I'll copy that, paste, and actually I'll just paste these very quickly. This one's spine 03 and spine 04, spine 05. Connect these all up. And these I'm going to bring down here, compile and save. So now because we actually have two state machines that are looping the channeled animation over and over, Got to go back to our spell casting standing still, our second channel spell loop here, and do the same thing. So I'll just create a lot of space, paste those in. We'll do a local to component, connect these over here. And we got our component to local, connect that down here, and compile and save. Just make sure you got your spine bones updated for each one. And once you confirm that, well, let's test this. All right, here we go, moment of truth. It's alive, and what's cool is that I can't turn too far backwards, so it's basically limiting it based on the clamp of 15 degrees of every single spine bone node. That's about the furthest back I can go. If I turn around, then it goes to the other side. Yeah, and then two, and we're right back to normal. And what's cool about this is, so I'm going to turn it on, I'm actually going to zoom into my character. Never even tried this before now, but it, it still works when I'm zoomed in to the first person. Now I probably need to adjust this a little bit in the future to have kind of floating arms out there so it doesn't look like I'm looking through the arms. Uh, but it does work, the aim does work, and I can just see my head there. So I need to think about how I'm gonna adjust that when I'm in the first person view, but suffice to say, it's working just fine. So the last thing about this is, is wouldn't it be nice to have some sort of mechanism by which I could have the channel spell on but still turn the camera without it turning the direction of the channeled spell? And so I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to set the right click functionality, or really any button you want to be able to be what controls whether or not the channeled spell aim is turned on. And so to do that, we're going to open up our third person character blueprint. So that's right here. And I'm just going to scroll up above one here. And I'm just going to search for right mouse button. So right mouse button there. And I'm going to create a new variable here called right mouse button active, right mouse button active. And it's very simple, so I'll drag in a reference to that, and we're going to set that to be true when this is pressed, and then we're going to set it to be false when it's released. So I duplicate it, connect this up just like this. Compile and save. So now back in our animation blueprint, we're going to get a reference to that right mouse button. So if I go to event graph here, and so here, spell casting standing still, this is no longer going to be the sole criteria by which this turns on. So I'm going to drag out a pin and search for and, I'm going to do an and boolean, connect this up, and then we got to get a reference to our third person character. And by the way, if you don't have this here as a reference to your third person character, you need to set up references. And I'll just show you briefly how I did that. So up here, you should have this piece by default in your event blueprint initialize animation. But I also needed to set this up where I cast a VP third person character. And then I have my third person character reference here. So you will need that reference to the third person character in order to get that new variable that we just created. So now I can search for right mouse button active, get. I'm just gonna change the order of these a little bit, make this a little cleaner, move this up, and we'll connect that to our second criteria. And so if this is false, then I'm just gonna set our spine rotation back to zero, back to nothing. And the reason I can do that is because back in our channeled spell, so back in these transform modify bone notes, our spine rotation here is set to add to existing. So it's not removing all rotation from the bone, it's just removing the additive rotation to the bone. So back in our event graph, if that looks good, then we can compile and save. Let's test this out one more time. So now two, and I can turn my camera, nothing happens, and right click, and right click, now I can see it, and then I stop holding right click, and I'm 
Yeah, so that's the only issue. When I stop holding right click, I am instantaneously back to that first position. And that's exactly why we needed the R interp to node because we needed to make that transition occur over a time period. So let's go back into our animation blueprint. We'll fix that right now. So what we need to do here, instead of setting it immediately to zero, so let me just drag this down a little bit, make a little bit of space in these two, and I'm gonna move this out just a little bit. We need to get our reference to our current spine rotation. And then we have to do the same thing, R interp to, and we're interpolating to our target, which is zero, zero, zero. And then we can connect this up. And we'll do the same thing, where delta time is one and the interp speed is 0.3. And that way it's going to adjust from the current rotation back to the normal rotation. It's still gonna be pretty fast because it's doing it 30% per tick, but not quite as fast as instantaneous. Compile and save, let's do one last test here. All right, turn on right mouse button, yep. And then right mouse button again, and I'm back to normal, but it takes just a quarter of a second or so to readjust. So just the last few things I wanna to do to clean things up. So if we go back into our animation blueprint, what I want to do is collapse all of this to a macro. So right click on Delta Rotator, Collapse to Macro. And the reason I want to collapse it to a macro is we might want to use this in the future for aiming other things. So I'm going to right click on this, say rename, and I'm just going to rename this to the Rotation of Camera. So the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of this, just zoom out a little bit and right click, and we're going to collapse that to a function. And I'll move this out so it doesn't overlap the other pins here. And if I right click on our new function and I'm gonna call it assess adjust aim. And then the description I can say assesses whether or not to adjust aim for spells and abilities. Maybe put in a reroute just so I can put it out like this. Compile and save. Now onto our third person character blueprint. I just wanna classify these two. And the activated gameplay ability, this one we set up several episodes ago, but Time to classify it, because we got more than one. So I'm gonna put them all in a category of gameplay abilities. And we are going to have several variables for our third person character under that category in the future. And the right mouse button is also gonna be used for gameplay abilities, so I'll classify it the same way. And compile and save. So that concludes our episode for today. And in the next episode, we're using our flamethrower effect to generate dynamic decals. So any material that it hits, well, depending on the material, if it's something that's flammable or if it's something that's not, uh, it's gonna have a different effect. And it'll update over time based on the intensity of the fire hit and also the material. So I hope to see you there.